welcome back everyone. Uh, now we dive into a very important topic, quality FDI, attracting meaningful investments for econo economic growth. Our moderator today is Andreas Dressler, Managing Director of the FDI Center. He will be joined by the following panelists. His Excellency Vahan Karobian, Minister of Econ Economy, Republic of Armenia. Michi Khadarelli, CEO of Enterprise Georgia. Hossam Heber, CEO of Gafi. Maria Jaburi, Bank Cantonal de Geneve. Nang Nangula Awanja, apologies for the pronunciations, from the Nib Namibia Investment Promotion and Development Board, and Carl Tabak, Board Chair of Invest in Canada. Can I please ask all panelists to join me on stage? Thank you. Nice to meet you. Carl, Hello. Good to see you again. How are you? Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Apologies for the slight delay in starting, but um, you may have experienced that before over the last day or two. Thank so uh, I think we're actually doing really well on time. My name is Andreas Dressler. I run a company called FDI Center. Uh, we're based in Berlin, Germany. The FDI stands for Foreign Direct Investment. We do two things. We work with governments and investment promotion agencies whom we help to attract more investment. And we also advise companies, multinational companies, on where to locate new greenfield facilities. Um, this is my 11th aim. So I've been to every single aim that's been held in person. And it's, it's great to be back here. It's great to be in a new venue, uh, really enjoying the conference. And I've got to say that this is, without a doubt, the most high-profile panel that I've ever had the pleasure to be moderating at AIM. Um, we've got an amazing group of panelists, so you're in for a fantastic session. You pick the right session to come to because we've got real practitioners, right? We've got a um, minister who is um, not just a minister, but actually has a strong business background. We've got the heads of investment promotion agencies, all of whom have investment promotion specializations, but also private sector background. We've got Carl, who is on the board of Invest in Canada, but... Um, also has a private sector background, and of course we've got Mario as the official private sector representative here, who's been on the other side of the table to advising governments on attracting investment. So we really have a, a wealth of knowledge here, and we're gonna use our time effectively. Um, I'll start with a few questions, but we're gonna open it up to you at the end of the session. So please do stay, and uh, please prepare some questions, and we'll leave enough time for you to, to address those. So I'm going to take a seat with the panelists and then we'll kick it off. So the topic of today's, today's session, can you hear me? Yep, that's better, yes. is quality investment. Mm. Um, maybe get a show of hands. How many of you in the room are from an investment promotion agency? Okay, so, and how many of you who just raised your hands would like to attract quality investment? Okay. How many of you wouldn't? How many of you just want any investment? <laughs> you almost raised your hand. So I think all investment promotion agencies and all governments in the world want to attract quality investment. Um, but it's one of those terms, a little bit like sustainable investment. Uh, nobody really knows what it is, right? Uh, or if you do know what it is, your definition of what it is is probably very different from somebody else's definition, right? So. Quality investment for you might be very different to quality investment to the person who put their hand up in the row behind you. So we're going to try and define what that means, right? We're going to try and untangle that and try and understand what quality FDI or quality investment really is. So I'm going to start with one question, the same question for all the panelists. 
for you, for your country, the location that you represent, what is quality investment? What type of investment would you like to attract, given all the different types of investments you possibly could? Why? And perhaps you could illustrate that with an example of a real project that you've attracted recently that really exemplifies what you want to attract. It's exactly the type of project that you would like to bring more of to your country. Does that sound right? Yeah. So we can either be spontaneous and somebody can volunteer first or we can just go down the row. There you go. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> I am Van Kirupian, Minister of Economy of Armenia. Just to brief you on how our economy does, I would say that we, we are one of the fastest grows, growing economies in the world. Last year, we ended up with 12.6% GDP growth, and the first quarter of this year is just as good as the last year, 12.2%. <clears throat> in our recent economic policy change, uh, we, we decided to take a, uh, more decisive steps in attracting uh, investments and, uh, and move from consumption-based growth to investment-led growth. And um, our results for last year uh, showed that we are quite successful and uh, were able to increase our FDI from 2% of GDP to more over 5% of GDP. And also general investments are doing quite good from less than 20% to more than 23%. So it's going uh, as per our plan. So, and of course, uh, in attracting FDI, we really focus on quality FDI. And for us, quality FDI is, uh, FDI is received from 500 global companies. So why we did choose them or do choose them? Because uh, these companies, these 500 global companies, are spending on R&D twice as much as the whole rest of the world combined. So, and Armenia, being a landlocked country, is really focused on attracting uh, R&D-intensive FDIs that could add a lot of value to our to our products. So, uh, and uh, and and we have a. A plan to attract these 500. So when we talk about example, I'll bring a very nice and uh, recently closed investment with microchip technology. So it's a chip design company, $550 billion uh, market cap company. And this company, we started to talk to them like several years ago and decided to build a team for them that will be appropriate for them to acquire and to expand in Armenia. So we did it, and uh, we created a school. It's, it's called Real School. Uh, we, we introduced an educational system there, and then uh, created the team, and it was acquired, and the deal was closed like early days of this May, and now they set up an office in Armenia. So, and, uh, uh, like uh, generalizing, I would say that in recent years we have got NVIDIA, Synopsis, Siemens, AMD, Cisco. So the companies that are really high profile and uh, their, their entry to Armenia is extremely important for us. Not only just because they do a, do a lot of investment, but because they also create and expand the ecosystem around chip design that we have. Excellent. Thank you very much. So um, this is one of the reasons I enjoy this conference. You learn so much. So um, Armenia, landlocked country, and yet we're hearing examples of, of some of the world's top corporations setting up very sophisticated chip design operations there, facilities there. And you know, it's a good way of framing that for us. Quality investment is it's got to be a top 500 company, a Fortune 500 company. So that's the type of company. And then they've got to do something in Armenia that's very high value added. Um, very knowledge intensive, so great examples, thank you. Nangula, um, Namibia is, I think, very different from Armenia. <laughs> so um, what are you looking for? What's quality for you? Okay. I think it was very good that you say quality is different from one person to another. And especially when we're talking in terms of Africa, quality is different because what we have noted, and I'm sure that 
The case of Namibia is similar to that of many African countries. So what we noted when we look at the Namibian economy is we, in, we attracted quite a good amount of FDI between the year 2000 and 2014. But most of that was in extractive <coughs> sectors. And they, because it was in extractive sectors, there was sometimes less taxation, there was less employment creation on the ground, and it kind of took like um, a, about, let's say, more than one million US dollars to create one job, and therefore, quality to us is, will probably be less simple for the next person. So quality first is just saying, we want projects that will leverage the, uh, the extractive sector in Africa. How can we add more value to the minerals that are mined out, out of Africa so that we are not exporting the jobs of our children? And therefore, how do we create jobs? But it's not just any jobs. How do we create what we call quality jobs? And uh, there were, for example, uh, in, in cases where Namibia attracted one investor in the textile industry, we created quite a number of jobs. But in the end, the labor movement in Namibia had to kind of get rid of that investment because the wages and the benefits were too low. So yes, it's not just, just any job. It's about quality jobs. It's about contribution to the government coffers in terms of physicals. It's about um, the environment and many others. And I can cite an example. They say a project we are called, calling a Cup Blue. It's a project that we are profiling currently as we are here on, the trip, uh, on, on this trip. That project is about uh, building a giant kelp farm in the ocean. Just uh, in Luders is a, uh, a place coast of Namibia. And what they did is build a huge farm there in the ocean of the giant kelp. And what it is doing quite a number of things. Number one is giving jobs to Namibians that have studied in the science sectors. It is also helping to restore marine life and also some of the uh, fish uh, uh, type, for example, pilchard that we lost is almost this opportunity that we can regain them back. Yes, it of course bringing us forex into the country as, uh, as earnings, and that is the type of project that we want to invite. So projects that will help us, of course, make sure that we uh, transfer knowledge in terms of technology, we create quality jobs, we contribute to the fiscals, we look after the social part and after the environment. Those are the type of jobs that we're looking for. And again, uh, invest, um, investments that will help us reduce the high unemployment rate and reduce the higher deficit uh, by increasing more uh, uh, export instead of relying heavily on import. Those are the type of projects that we want to attract to Namibia. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Nangula. That, a, that example is a fantastic example. Sounds like a, an amazing project. It, it is. You know, ticks all the boxes, creates jobs, quality jobs, um, but also helps with environmental topics. So fantastic project. Also interesting to see, I think, the, the parallels between countries. Um, my firm does a lot of work in Australia. You might not compare Australia with Namibia, but actually Australia is trying to do exactly the same thing. They export lots of minerals. They export lots of agricultural products. They get put in containers and shipped off somewhere else. And they would love to have some more local value added. So, you know, lots of countries that at first glance don't seem similar have a very similar definition when it comes to quality investment. So, Michael, over to you. Um, you know, another, we're well represented here from the Caucasus, so uh, great that you could be here. Um, Georgia is probably very different to Armenia. I don't know, we'll find out. What's your definition of quality? What would you like to attract? Um, I think it's a very interesting question, Andreas, and I totally agree with my colleagues that it depends for one country to another. I think we have to add some dimensions to these questions. First dimension is the level of the development of the country. I think that um, after that you can say whether the country should attract any type of investments or the quality investments. I think there are some conditions for the country that it's more feasible to attract and not to say no to any investments unless it's a threat for the country. Uh, so this is exactly how we started. Let's say 15 years ago, we were targeting sectors like manufacturing of textile. Um, of course, there's not much value in terms of these high salaries, but it's good for employment, right? But as you excel to the more developed stages, then you realize that uh, quality FDI is important. That's why we renovated our strategy like seven years ago. And we have a matrix called desirability and feasibility. So first thing is that investment has to be feasible. 
and you have to have some advantages to attract that. But the second thing is the desirability, whether it's desirable for the, for the government strategy, right? A project can be feasible, but the value that it brings might not be desirable. So if the investment meets these two, two criteria, then we kind of try to target that. Uh, so it has to bring the knowledge to the country. I think the good example would be the Israeli investments that we have that manufactures airplane parts for Boeing. I think that's a good example. Brings a lot of knowledge to the country. Another thing is, of course, the uh, efficiency seeking FDI, the type of FDI that uh, creates high value jobs. So this is the cornerstone of our strategy, I think. And going forward, we will, I think, shift more to the quality FDI and far from, let's say, the FDIs that bring only employment or low salary jobs. Excellent, thank you. I've actually been in that facility, Elbit, the Israeli company that's making aircraft parts there for Boeing. So, you know, really, really high standards. So that is definitely a quality investment because it's, it's also creating a lot of effects for Georgian suppliers. Um, the company, as you, you obviously know, is training lots of employees. So there are great multiplier effects happening there as well. You also raised a point which is, is really important, which we may elaborate on a little later. Do you say no as an investment promotion agency? If you come across a project or a potential investor that doesn't meet your standard, that doesn't fit into your matrix, would you ever actually say no to an investor? So maybe something that we can explore later in the panel. Um, awesome. Uh, I understand you're in this role for five, six months. Is that correct? Um, so um, welcome to the investment promotion world. <laughs> We'd love to hear from you. Uh, Egypt has obviously been a player in this for a long time, has always had a very high profile as an FDI destination. What are you focusing on? What is quality for you? Well, thank you very much. And um, uh, uh, our definition of uh, quality FDI would, uh, would come in two layers, actually. One, it's more on a general definition uh, which mainly relates to job creations and deepening uh, our industry, which has been there for quite some time, and uh, trying to uh, increase the local uh, components for our industries. The second layer would go for specific in, uh, sectors that we are uh, uh, promoting uh, to uh, expedite our development and economic growth uh, plans. Uh, given the vision that we have put for ourselves, uh, as we call it, the Egypt uh, Vision 2030, and being updated now to be uh, 2050. So, <clears throat> uh, for the first vision, we, we look into job creations, we look into deepening our uh, local uh, component manufacturing, uh, as well as increasing our uh, foreign currency inflows. Um, for the sectoral uh, uh, definition, uh, we go in more specifically to certain sectors uh, to create FDIs in these sectors, such as, for example, the um, uh, car manufacturing, where we started to make a strategic planning uh, for this particular sector, uh, green hydrogen, for example, uh, logistics, uh, 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 healthcare, and so on. So we, we put for each sector, certain quality standards for the uh, FDIs uh, at, uh, uh, that we're targeting uh, to uh, bring value uh, to, or add value to our economy uh, and ultimately uh, uh, satisfy the general definition in terms of job creations and uh, deepening our, our industries. Excellent. Thank you, Hassan. Um Carl, Carl uh, also, well, not new to FDI, I know you've been practicing uh, from a business perspective for a long time, but new to the investment promotion agency world as, as the new chair of the Board of Invest in Canada. Canada, OECD country, arguably uh, it's one of those countries that doesn't even need an investment promotion agency, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Investors come anyway, you've got a big market, you've got resources, you've got access to the US uh, just across the border. You know, why does Canada need an investment promotion agency and, and what's your role? What are you trying to bring that wouldn't come anyway? Yeah. Very good question. Thank you very much. And it's a great pleasure to be, uh, to, to be here and share some insights on how 
how we do it in Canada, but I mean, the question that you're raising is, is a very important one is, you know, why, why would we need even a, a, an investment promotion agency? And frankly, you know, uh, Canada is a very decentralized country. Can, Canada is a country of provinces. The provinces run the country essentially. And at the federal level, uh, the uh, Invest in Canada, which is the investment promotion agency, has only been in existence for about six years. So it's a relatively new, uh, a, a new startup. And you may wonder, you know, in a country of, you know, Canada's GDP is about, what, $2 trillion, uh, G7 country, uh, the bulk of the FDI that comes into Canada doesn't need an agency. But uh, so, so how do we qualify, you know, what is, direct, what is quality FDI and, but, and where does Invest in Canada want to uh, act to move the needle? And this is really how, you know, the team talks about it, is in terms of moving the needle. Where can we have an impact? And, you know, we've set a few uh, uh, sort of key sectors that we think uh, as an investment promotion and attraction agency we can, uh, we, we can operate on is having transformative investments that for us, you know, would lay the foundation of either a new or an emerging industry and that will have generational impact. I'll give you examples for that. For instance, electric vehicles. In Canada, we've been operating for a long time on the automo uh, uh, automotive uh, supply chain. Uh, so where is that sector going? It's going into the EV and we <coughs> want to be an actor on the EV. And I think my colleague was mentioning, you know, how to you know, use your natural resources and value add the natural resources. Well, one way of doing that, we know that in, a ba in electric vehicle batteries, you know, there are these critical minerals that we have in Canada. So we want to be able to use our ability to not only have the minerals, but to transform the minerals and, and use what we could, uh, our, our presence in the uh, uh, automobile supply chain. So we think this is a place where as an investment promotion agency, we can we can act. Obviously, investments that create well-paying jobs. I think that has been mentioned. Um, you know, and we, we got to be careful on you know creating jobs when we're operating in an economy where there's already almost full employment. So there has to be uh, uh, you know a, a, a meaningful job, and we have to be able to deliver those to the private sector. And uh, an investment that brings knowledge transfer for us is also very important and that adds value. You know, we talked about that allows us to execute on the strategy, like I've mentioned in the, in the, in the EV space, or to add value to our natural resources. Instead of just exporting our minerals, our lithium, our graphite, we want to uh, uh, transform it. And one example, I mentioned an example, I think recently, uh, a couple of weeks ago, PowerCo, a, a subsidiary of Volkswagen, uh, announced that they will be uh, building their largest EV uh, uh, battery plant outside of Europe in Canada. It's a $7 billion investment, so sort of roughly $4.8 billion uh, euro investment. And for us, that is, uh, uh, you know, sort of a sweet spot of the kind of quality of the eye or transformational investment that uses our geographic position, uses our position in the supply chain on the electric, in the, in the, in the automobile space, uses the availability of our natural resources, transforms them uh, in, in, uh, in what will be St. Thomas in, uh, uh, in Ontario. Excellent, thank you. And just that last example, the Volkswagen investment in Canada. Uh, for those of you who are here who are not with an investment promotion agency, if any of you are from government, ministries, those projects don't just land there. I mean, I know that people on your team, Carl, worked for years to get that project against really tough competition. So there's a lot of work that goes into pulling a project like that on land. Uh, absolutely. And, and maybe I, I, I want to add one. There, there is also a misconception that these projects, you know, companies go around the world shopping for financial incentives. And I can tell you from experience, that's not necessarily what they want. They're looking for quality of your, uh, quality of people is now number one of what people talk about. They want to have qualified manpower. They want to have educated workforce, access 
to the resources, access to markets. You know, in Canada, for instance, we provide access to a market of over 1.5 billion people, free trade, free uh, uh, with, with no tariffs. So the non-financial aspects of the criteria play a very important role today. It's not just about, you know, come and invest and you get a tax-free treatment. Yeah, great point, and that's I think a good transition to Mario, who's in the financial industry but has advised governments in the past. Um, what are your thoughts, Mario? What what is quality investment? Um, are you a quality investor <laughs> as a as a bank? Thanks, Andres. It's a uh... First, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm not only the odd one out, but I'm at the end of this esteemed panel, so it's very difficult for me to actually say something that hasn't already been said. But um, I think just to sort of maybe even summarize very briefly, quality FDIs is, is it, there are certain constants. We're all looking for employability, diversification, innovation, inclusivity, all these nice buzzwords which, which we as investors or agencies or governments like to have when we attract quality FDI. But I think just to add maybe <clears throat> another layer, um, one looking at it from the government or the agency perspective, sort of, um, let's say, uh, politics and democratic political systems have a certain lifespan. So, and sometimes that could be very short. So it's very important that when a government or an agency in, in cohesion with the government strategy is looking to attract FDI, it is more long-term based rather than short-term gains. And that's difficult sometimes to have because obviously we all want to have those big wins and those big wins to come within our tenure and for those big wins to be very quick. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we marry it up with, with a strategy and a long-term strategy of, of developing and growing a particular economy. The second thing I would add is, is, is relevance, be it from a, a global economic relevance standpoint, be it from a geopolitical standpoint, there's always something going on which is topical and relevant right now, which needs to factor in, in our strategies and in our uh, ambitions of attracting quality FDI. So, so it's a complex matrix which needs to be constantly evolving in order to make it relevant for the particular economy that we're trying to attract, and also for it to be interesting for investors to come in and invest in. Excellent, thank you. And you've raised a great point. Your definition of quality is really what should inform your strategy, right? The strategy that an IPA has should start with defining why do we want investment? And then you've all outlined reasons why you want it to create quality jobs, to uh, address certain fiscal deficits, whatever the reasons are, and then what type of investment is gonna help us achieve that is your definition of quality. So if I could just summarize the, this first round of questions, I, I think what we've heard is that um, depending on where a country is and its level of development, the definition of quality could be very, very different, right? So you've got countries that have high unemployment. For them, quality is jobs. We just want jobs. We want people off the street and in employment. That's it, right? And then you've got very developed countries. A um, good example is I'm based in Germany, our neighbors in the Netherlands. Um, their definition of quality is we want companies that contribute to our goals to become a net zero economy. And we also want to achieve certain societal goals like gender equality, inclusiveness. Um, that's what they want. And they really look for projects that help them meet those goals and they say no they actually turn down a lot of projects that may be very attractive to other parts of the world and that they would have gladly received as recently as three, four years ago, and they turn those projects down because they can afford to be selective. So that's the one point. There is a spectrum. The second point is you can have more than one definition of quality investment as a country. And also, it's, it's not static. It doesn't stay the same. It changes as you develop, as your priorities develop. Um, as your government policy changes as well. So there is no one definition of quality that applies to everyone and that always remains the same. Okay. So thank you very much for that first round. Um, those were the, that was the easy question. So we're gonna get um, a little bit more detailed now. And I, I take your point, Mario. You know, if we go in this direction, it makes it harder for you to think of things, but um, it's more challenging that way. So we'll use the same sequence. I think that worked very well. 
And um, what I'd like to ask each of the panelists now is, now that we've heard what quality is for you, what are you doing to attract that type of investment? In other words, how does that influence your policies, um, the way you target investors, the way you approach investors, the way you go to market? How is the operational and policy part influenced by your definition of quality? All right, so that's um, a bit of a trickier question. If you'd like to go first. Yes. So, <clears throat> yeah, it's uh, very important that after you define quality investment, what is quality FDI, you, you make a, a good plan or roadmap to achieve this the, uh, and then land this uh, investment. So <clears throat> one of the very important projects that I would love to share is, uh, is what we thought will be good continuation of our, uh, our efforts to bring to Armenia like uh, TRA, chip design companies and uh, we thought about uh, the next stage which is manufacturing and uh, and our our plan there is to is to set up a, a special economic zone where we can uh, offer investors uh, 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 an environment where they can uh, go forward with manufacturing uh, uh, a high class equipment or or uh, we, we are specifically focused on inter IoT uh, production, and uh, therefore we started a project uh, which is a, a dry port and special economic zone project uh, in an area of Armenia where, where there are a lot of talented tech workers. It's in Gyumri and it's a dry port project. So we are in the midst of this project, and the idea is that there we our focus to bring uh, a lot of IoT manufacturers so that the, along with the engineering capacity that we already have, we can also uh, engage manufacturing capacity. Not everyone can be a, 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 a chip designer or chip engineer, others have to manufacture. So therefore, we have started uh, this project and uh, the infra infrastructure is very much important to attract the FDI. And uh, along with people and uh, infrastructure, we are hopeful that we can land. And we are in negotiation. We can see the apparent interest from the uh, investors of this type of things. Excellent. I mean, that is a very impressive example, you know, building upon your contacts to the semiconductor industry to attract the next level, which is manufacturing. It's very ambitious. But I think everybody in the FDI world knows the case of Intel in Costa Rica, where you know Intel against the odds attracted uh, and, uh, Costa Rica attracted an Intel manufacturing facility, a fab, um, <coughs> just a little under 30 years ago, which which just transformed the country. So it's I think great to think big in FDI attraction, but also as you've just mentioned, put in place the real conditions that will enable that as well. Thank you. Yeah, the important thing is that, um, again, going back into landlockedness, uh, I would say that because the special economic zone is, is just in the area of the airport, and we thought that uh, for air shipments, probably the IoT uh, products are, are the most uh, suitable. So, and then air shipments would help uh, also to, to uh, connect this special economic zone, zone to the world. Yeah, definitely high value products. Yeah. Thank you. Nangula. Yes. No, thank you very much. So, I think we are doing quite a number of things, and those things are dependent on different sectors. But the first one that we are doing is also messaging and communication. There are things that I think for us as Namibians we took for granted, but as I've started to travel around the world, I found those questions. So for example, I've gone somewhere and then I've been asked, what about all the conflict in Africa? And I thought, conflict in Africa? Okay, I think Namibia, I don't know the last time we talk about conflict. Namibia is one of the most peaceful and very stable and secure country in the world. Uh, it's got the best roads and so forth. Therefore, one of the things that we need to do is making sure that our message reaches the investors that we want to attract. How do we 
send our messaging so that people will get to know about Namibia. I know they understand Africa, Namibia is part of Africa, but we will love them to understand and to know about Namibia. That is the first thing. Then the second thing is about our existing invest, uh, investors and our existing uh, business people. And there is quite a number of constraints that they are facing. And therefore, when we studied the economy and when we realized that our economy started to not grow well and there was some capital flight between 2015 going into 2020, we worked with the Harvard Growth Lab. And then we found out that, okay, we need to have more engagement with the private sector. So we are having something we call productivity task force. How do we increase productivity of existing sectors in Namibia? So we want to remove constraints. We are identifying those constraints, and then we remove those constraints. And then we're looking at other sectors that we want to bring into the country. <laughs> sectors, if they are more in manufacturing, then cost becomes a big measure. And that's when then we talk about incentives. So other countries are having incentives. Namibia had an incentive regime. It did not attract the type of investors we were looking for, so we are reviewing it. Uh, but then we want to go into services. Into services, most of what we need is skills. So how do we make sure that we train for the skills that we need in Namibia, but at the same time, talk about some form of a golden visa program that we are able to attract uh, uh, the kind of skills we need. Uh, the quality of life in Namibia is very good. The country, we are a huge country, 824,000 square meter, with 2.8 million people. We are the second least densely populated country in the world. Very safe and beautiful, and therefore many people will definitely love to come and work in Namibia. And therefore what we do then is how do we have visa programs that will bring the kind of skills that will support the sectors that we are looking for. So yes, we are coming up with various measures. So instead of just doing the normal things that everybody is doing with regard to improving our ease of doing business, having a one-stop center. Yes, we are doing all of that one, but we are also doing targeted effort and targeted uh, uh, actions and, and steps for each of the sectors that we want to bring to Namibia based on whether the sector is existing already in Namibia or is a sector that we are targeting. Excellent, thank you. And again, if I could just pick up a few points. One is um, investors don't know everything and um, you know, even the, the most sophisticated executives may not know everything about Armenia, Namibia, Georgia, if they haven't been there before. So it's good to, to bring up certain points that stick with them. I remember when we, we first spoke last year, you told me that Namibia is one of the most gender equal countries in the world, uh, in the top five or six, I believe. Yes. You know, that, that's the kind of thing that surprises and then sticks with people. So it's good to put that in your positioning. Yes. And, um, also the point you made helping the private sector, we're talking about attracting investment, but um, anything that you do to help foreign investors, by definition helps your local companies too, because you're making the business environment more attractive for everybody. And maybe one thing I would like to add is uh, we are uh, going very big into the green hydrogen uh, industry. Uh, we have identified one large scale project that we want to support as a government, but we are also attracting other investors. And what we are doing with them is, we don't have the regulation at this stage. I think we all know that green uh, hydrogen is new, the standards are not known, the regulations are there. So we are using the first, what we call the uh, feasibility implementation agreement with the first uh, 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 operator. We are using it to negotiate what the regulations of the industry is, uh, is going to be like. And some of the things we're looking is, how do we de-risk the projects, especially from government events. What are the potential government events in the future, whether it is possible laws that could impact the, uh, the industry? How do we make sure that we commit to this uh, project, but whatever commitment we give to this project, we will give to every other investor in that industry so that we de-risk those uh, projects that are coming in this new sector. Excellent, thank you. Yes. Uh, Michael, uh, I know Georgia had a big wave of reform a long time ago and uh, you know it's already for a couple of decades been one of the easiest places to set up a business um, anything administrative I mean you know, I've been in your lovely center where uh, you can sit down have a coffee and all your licenses get taken care of in a couple of hours so you've already got all of that so what else are you doing now to attract the type of quality investment you want um, uh, the process is pretty simple but very, very difficult and um, let's say 
you work with 100 companies that finally you get only one. That's, that's the job that we do, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, as, so, as, so, as soon as we know that what is the quality investments for us, we know exactly what type of companies. Mm -hmm. So instead of targeting countries, we're targeting concrete companies. So then we go out and read their annual reports. If they are thinking to expand to our part of the world, then that's our target company. So let's say we start with 10,000 companies mm -hmm. and then we start to reach out to them and try to um, have a value proposition that meets their needs. So every time we try to watch the competition, not just in the region, but around the region as well. So if there are some countries that are offering additional things, that means that uh, we have to find something to balance that. So the, the newest thing that we did is the FDI grant program that you, Andreas, are very aware of, where we are giving the 15% cash back on the investment for only uh, target sectors, the sectors that are the quality in FDIs for us. And I think this is working because at the end of the day when investor is comparing two countries, right? If everything is equal, another, even a small incentive is sometimes a decision maker. So I think um, it's a good idea to always like have a look of what others are offering, what are the countries who are doing better than you and this is exactly what we do right now. So um, I hope that we can uh, have more quality FDAs to Georgia. Okay, excellent. So I mean, one thing that I've heard or we've heard from the last three responses is really having a very targeted approach, right? To knowing who you want to attract and you can know that because you've defined what quality is, but then breaking that down to specific sectors, specific types of companies so that you can be very proactive and, and very focused in your approach not just in your business development approach, but also in the policies and the incentives that you develop. So that's um, definitely something that's coming out of the discussion. Um, Hossam, what are you doing that you haven't done before in Egypt to, to bring the type of investment that you want? Well, uh, given the, uh, the magnitude of the economy of the Egypt and the diversification of its different sectors, it's quite uh, uh, important for us to always reform and enhance. Uh, we have more than 400,000 and we're approaching 500,000 companies operating in Egypt actually. So that's, that's a large uh, number. And we need to always enhance the, uh, uh, the business environment. So ease of doing business is, is, is on top of our agenda and we always try to uh, shorten periods and uh, lessen the, the, the steps and, and processes. Uh, we're doing that through digital, uh, digitalization process for incorporation and aftercare uh, of companies. And uh, we're also uh, uh, going uh, through a massive uh, process in uh, transforming the, all the governmental services to be e-government uh, uh, with, with, with a vision that's being implemented and uh, to be completed within the coming couple of years. Uh, additionally, we're offering lots of incentives and currently we're doing uh, uh, a mechanism whereby it's a custom-made incentives for certain sectors, for certain type of investors, uh, so that we can uh, uh, attract more and more of what we want, uh, such FDI and going back to the quality uh, FDI definition. Uh, so we're, we're working on that. Uh, we're having special incentives for, for example, the green hydrogen, for automobile industry, for logistics, for healthcare, for SMEs even, and startups and entrepreneurships which is uh, considering uh, Egypt is considered to be one of the largest in Africa to attract uh, FDIs for VCs and startups uh, and so on. So uh, we're, we're trying to custom made somehow uh, such incentives and, uh, uh, and, and based on that we start uh, developing our promotional strategies uh, 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 accordingly. Uh, we also uh, worked on uh, uh, diligently in, in reducing the time for setting up uh, any project uh, given the, uh, uh, the processes uh, that the government takes and we issued what we call the golden license which takes only 20 days to give all the necessary approvals for any project uh, whatever the project is a big service or industry uh, it just takes one, 20 days and you get your uh, 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 license to uh, erect your, your, your project and including the operating license as well so, uh, and we also provide different uh, schemes where we have investment parks, we have free zone parks, uh, we have technology parks, and we have special economic zone parks 
and they are all spread out in, in the whole country uh, uh, so that it would cater for the special needs for each and every investor. And all of them has uh, one objective, which, uh, which, which is ease of doing business and kind of a one-stop shop uh, for government approvals. Okay, excellent. So good combination of ease of doing business plus specialized incentives. Um, quick question, you know, how are you then carrying that message out? Does Gafi have offices overseas? Currently, we don't. We depend heavily on our uh, 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 diplomatic uh, missions, mm -hmm. but in our plan is that we're going to do that. Okay, great. And um, Carl, again, you mentioned earlier Canada is a country of provinces. So, I, correct me if I'm wrong. I would, I would imagine that it's difficult for invest in Canada to really influence the business environment because that's managed by all the different provinces and it's kind of out of your control. So given that, what are you doing to really, as you said, move the needle? Yeah, that's right. So, <clears throat> I mean, again, a little bit like what I was saying is focusing on things that, that, that move the needle and focusing on the big underlying uh, uh, elements, right? So we've talked about, you know, stable, uh, predictable business environment and political environment. So, you know... We don't, like the federal government doesn't control what happens in the provinces, but, but usually the succession of governments, Mario, you were saying that the terms are four years. In Canada, we find ourselves in elections, uh, whether it's federal or provincial, you know, more than, more than once every four years. So, so there's, there, there, there's a lot of uh, uh, sort of uh, elections and political changes, but, you know, the, the stability of the business environment and the predictability of the legal landscape, that remains very stable, very unchanged. And this is something that I think, you know, every level of government is, is, uh, uh, is cognizant about. From the federal government uh, standpoint, we work on infrastructure. So both, you know, making sure the physical infrastructure, you know, roads and ports and airports is, is up to, uh, to class, but also the legal infrastructure and in terms of uh, you know, the, the, the uh, free trade agreements. Canada has over 15 free trade agreements with 51 countries, right? And that, so this kind of infrastructure is what gives businesses the ability to have market access. So these are things that federal government can do and, and that, that Invest in Canada can work with the uh, provincial uh, uh, agencies and municipal agencies. Some of our big cities like Toronto, like Montreal, like Vancouver have their own investment attraction agencies that are very active, that are very uh, uh, capable and that have their own, uh, their, their own agenda and Invest in Canada works with them to deliver what we call the Team Canada approach. I mean, you know, to land uh, power co into St. Thomas, Ontario is not just, you know, invest in Canada working on it. It's working with uh, uh, invest in Ontario and it's working with Toronto Global. It's working with the regional actors, the regional stakeholders. That is extremely, uh, extremely important. One, one, one thing also that uh, we, we do is bringing, you know, how, how do you attract investment is you need buy-in from all the stakeholders in the economy. Right? We're big, diversified economy, mature economy in a way, but we work with academia, we work with the universities, we work with centers of excellence to see what can we add in what region that's going to have a multiplier effect, as opposed to you know, just looking at you know, who's willing to come and invest in the, in the country. The, the sort of the natural ecosystem will take care of that, where an agency like ours will, uh, uh, will, will bring value is when we do it at that strategic level. Yeah. And actually, thank you, Carl. And another great point that um, Carl raised, I mean, you know, if, if you look at a country like Canada, it is so diverse, and you've got metropolitan areas, Toronto, Quebec, uh, Vancouver, but you've also got remote areas with, you know, high indigenous populations. Um, so again, there's no one-size-fits-all definition of quality. Um, you've 100%. got to be cognizant. And, and the, need, the need of those communities is different. Yeah. The ability of Toronto 
to attract foreign direct investment is completely different than the ability of Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island to attract foreign direct investment. Mm -hmm. And sometimes this is where, as a federal organization, we need to overcompensate a little bit and, and, and come in and, and you know, help the, the smaller communities making an investment that in its size may not move the needle on Canada's GDP, but it's going to move the needle on that community and it's going to be helpful for that community. Excellent. Thank you, Carl. Mario, maybe um, will you put on your uh, private sector hat and think of you know, as yourself as an investor, what would a government have to do, any government or any investment promotion agency, to attract a quality investor um, like the one you represent? It's quite simple. I think it's, it's not rocket science. Investors look for political stability. They look for a market, which is a growing market. They look for an ecosystem where the legal and regulatory framework are independent and enforceable. They're looking for ease of business, doing business, as uh, uh, the panel has mentioned. They're looking for a competitive fiscal system, which allows the investments in the long term to prosper. So all these elements actually combined together give you the matrix and the ecosystem which you sort of prioritize one country or one uh, particular sector from another. Um, and, and it really is boils down to uh, finding the right partners, the partners that are willing to work alongside the investors and really uh, understand the goals, as, as Carl was saying, from, from all of the stakeholders involved, uh, not only from the side of the investor trying to make a, basically a good return on his investment, but also what is the contribution? So are they contributing to the ESG strategy of the country or the province or whatever it may be? Are they contributing to the um, uh, employability again and the inclusivity? So all these things create an ecosystem which either works or doesn't for an investor. Excellent, thank you. So uh, we've, we've um, had two great rounds of, of uh, q and I'd like to ask you to start thinking of your questions. I have one more that I'm going to ask anyone from the panel to respond to, so we won't go through the, the whole sequence again. But please start thinking of questions, because in a few minutes we'll open it up to you. And I'm sure there will be many good questions from the floor. Um, the one question I have, and, and anyone who would like to answer this, please feel free, is the question of measurement, right? So at the end of the day, you have to measure what you're doing, you have to assess your performance, and you, you have to, as an IPA, demonstrate to stakeholders, we've generated results, you know, you've invested in us and here are the, the outcomes. Or as a government, you have to say, we've invested in the IPA, what has it brought us, right? And the typical measures for doing that are jobs, just the absolute job number, we created X hundred, X thousand jobs, Often it's capex. You know, we we brought in you know a billion dollars of FDI, and that's it. And it's always been that way, right? So there's a, a kind of um, an attempt over the last few years to broaden that set of indicators. And if you start to define quality investment differently, how can you then measure results differently? So my question to anyone who'd like to answer this, and I hope a few of you do, is other than just number of jobs and pure capex, what else are you using, could you be using to measure the outcomes of, of your activities? Maybe I'll be strange, but we are not looking for jobs, actually. So, uh, And I'll bring a funny example. We are uh, opening a new factory, a very technological, and with our prime minister, and uh, then he asked to, to the founders, how many jobs do we have in this huge factory? And they said, uh, 100, but they said it in a guilty voice, like 100, because it's too technological. And I said, okay, now we are looking for as less jobs as possible. So, because our aim is to attract or to land investments where uh, companies would be world-class competitive and, uh, and very productive. So for us, labor jobs are, are not, not the aim, it's, it's a consequence. So, uh, and uh, we are looking for high productivity, actually. So for us, uh, when we look or, or in our dashboard, the three main 
main figures and or indicators that we are looking for. It's the, of course, it's uh, total investment size, it's the economic growth, and it's labor productivity. So, and okay. for us, uh, the keyword of our economic policy is productivity, and uh, uh, we are looking for high productive jobs. So, it's a meaningful jobs, as you say. Uh, so, that would bring competitiveness to our companies, resilience to our companies. And then, of course, as a result of it, we'll have uh, high quality jobs at the end of the day. Excellent, thank you. Great, great example, good indicators. Um, anybody else? Awesome. Well, ultimately, of course, economic growth is, is GDP growth is, 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 is the ultimate goal because it creates <laughs> Uh, it comes with creating jobs and so on. But we do have uh, some, uh, in addition to qua uh, uh, quantitative uh, targets, there are also qualitative targets like, uh, like uh, women empowerment, for example, like youth empowerment and involvement, financial inclusion. For uh, societies like, uh, like Egypt, where we have more than 65% informal economy, we need to have more financial inclusions within this, uh, this sector, uh, and we put targets for that as well. So, uh, so there are lots of uh, indicators that we target at the end of the day uh, to measure and continue measure uh, in a very, very close manner here. Excellent. I'm really glad to hear you say that because there are so many benefits that FDI can bring. I mean, you know, there are the hard benefits like GDP growth, but there are also many societal benefits that are more subtle, but equally important. So really glad to hear that those are part of your system. Yeah, and I forgot to mention environmental uh, targets as well, yeah. because uh, since we hosted the COP27, <coughs> we started to put environmental uh, uh, targets in this respect, in terms of carbon emissions and uh, the, our contribution to uh, 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 a cleaner and greener uh, environment as well. Excellent, thank you. Carl, and then we'll open it up to yeah. one question from the floor. I've just yeah. been told we're maybe, maybe on a I tight can, schedule, but Carl, please yeah, go maybe ahead. Maybe I can bounce on that a little bit. So it, 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 it's very interesting because when I got into this role, you know, coming from, from the private sector, the first question I asked is how do we measure? Like, how do we, what, what, what KPIs do you track? And what do you measure? And, and you realize that obviously there are KPIs in terms of net inflow, and, and, and we, we, you know, we, we measure that. <laughs> But I think to me, the most important measures are, you need to tie the measures with your objectives. So, you know, if you have high unemployment rate and you wanna fill, you wanna, you wanna create jobs, well, job creation becomes a big measure for you. Mm -hmm. If you don't have high unemployment rate, but you want transformational uh, investments, then you need to get some qualitative feedback from the community where that investment took place and see how did that investment transform the economy? Was that a contributor to building a new ecosystem? Mm -hmm. So something very qualitative, not necessarily measurable by numbers, mm -hmm. but, but is, is probably as, if not more important than the numbers. And finally, whatever you measure, and, and one of the things that I've learned, and you're more of a specialist than I am in these, in these but there are various ways of measuring FDI. So, you know, particularly if you're uh, uh, your people are incentivized in a certain way, all of a sudden you're going to see that the measures start following a certain level of, uh, of, of measurement. But no matter how you measure, make sure you measure consistently. Because if your method of measuring moves, then you, know, you really have no indicator on your dashboard to know how things are progressing. So we're trying to keep, even on the economic uh, uh, one, we try to keep a consistent way of measuring to see how things are progressing. Excellent. Thank you, Carl. So who would like to go first? We've got time for one question. Yes, sir. Hmm? Uh, you probably need a mic. It's coming. Thank you all for your uh, input. My question is just basically mainly on uh, for you to do the great work you're doing. You need a team uh, to help you support the vision that you put in place. I mean, as uh, Michel mentioned, I mean, 10,000 businesses that you need to contact. 
there's a lot of people to contact and so you need that energy from your team. How can you attract the right people to your team given that you have, obviously you're part of a government, you have a budget in, in place, specifically when you've got the private sector always competing for the talents? It's a really, really good question. This, you know, how do you as, you know, I think in all cases here, public sector agencies get the best, brightest, most motivated people when you can't often pay what the private sector is paying. Um, yeah, well, that's really tough. I mean, uh, I think it's very rare to find a person that has experience in investment attraction. That's not like a, being a lawyer or like a physicist. So it's always tough. But I think the best way to do it is to start with someone that has the skills that is good in investment attraction. I think, first of all, is the people skills. So in our team, we divide two parts of the team. One part works on the front line with investors. Another part is more analytical, and this team works together. Uh, I think that most of the team members that we have, we have, uh, let's say, we developed step by step, and now they're very experienced. I think it will be really, really hard to find one, uh, let's say, Swiss knife uh, to do all this stuff. So I think you have to divide these two, because I believe that in investment attraction, there is a front side and back side. Um, and I don't think there, um, there are some perfect people who do both of them, but I think it's better to split the team. So answering your question, how I think it takes a lot of time, and I think the finding the right people, and then trying to grow them. I think that's the best solution. Uh, I'll, I'll actually concentrate on, a, on, a, on another side of the story. So for us, it's uh, extremely important to develop people rather than to find people. So I think that uh, the, the uh, race for finding right people is, is not the right race. Actually, uh, it's better to concentrate on the development of people. So and then you can have uh, very motivated, growing, uh, and, uh, and capable uh, team that can bring results. So for us, of course, uh, Armenians are good. At the, we have a huge diaspora, twice as big as uh, people in the country, so we can attract uh, uh, Armenians from all around the world. But also, uh, it's very important to grow people inside the team. And we spend a lot, invest a lot on, on our people, and we can see the right results uh, from that. Yeah? So it's more important to invest in your people rather than to uh, uh, to spend time and resources to find the right people abroad and pay them a lot of salaries. Yeah, great. Um, Maybe I can uh, just jump on that from from the Canadian perspective. I was mentioning Invest in Canada has only been in existence for six years. That doesn't mean that the, the country has only been doing investment attractions for six years. Years before that, it was part of a governmental department. And one of the reasons for the creation of Invest in Canada, the government wanted a, 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 what we call a crown corporation or an agency that is at arm's length a little bit. And that, so that operates somehow independently from the governmental apparatus. And part of that is also to you know, attract and to groom you know, different kind of entrepreneurial spirit, different uh, you know, uh, people that are looking for maybe a career path that's different than just you know, growing into the, 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 the sort of the governmental apparatus. And that was a main driver for the creation. It sits outside of government. There's got, you know, the offices are outside of government. The employees are not civil servants. They're, they're, uh, so everything is very much closer to the private sector that, 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 the, uh, that, that Invest in Canada interacts with. Mm -hmm. so, Yes, no, I think for us, we are a relatively new organization in office for about two years, and therefore we are riding on about bringing about a change in Namibia, and therefore we are really targeting people that have got a, a kind of a purpose-driven, and people that see themselves as bringing about change. Therefore, our value positioning is how much do they tie to our vision and purpose as a, com as a company. We say we exist to unlock opportunities that will enable a quality of life for all Namibians. And therefore, if you are one of the people who is kind of looking at fellow Namibians that are going through challenges and you want to be part of a team that is a catalyst for change, then we'd like you to join us. 
Of course, skills is, is a given, uh, experience is a given, but really about purpose, passion, and wanting to be part of a change. That is what we are that's, doing. I think that's a, a great way to conclude because I, you know, there's lots of things that you need to know in investment promotion, lots of skills that you can learn or have, but if you don't have the passion to promote your location, it's not going to work. So um, I'd love to have more time. I wish we could go on. I'd like to thank all of you for being here and staying here and, and you know, being active listeners. But more importantly, I'd like you to hopefully agree with me that this has been an excellent panel and we've had fantastic input from all of our panelists. So thank you very much. Two minutes. Thank you, Andreas, for a great thought-provoking panel discussion. Um, it is time for our next panel discussion. Can I ask everyone on stage if you could just make your way onto the floor? That would be great. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to... Okay, our next panel discussion is boosting capital markets to develop market efficiency through FPI. Our moderator is Martin Konsman, Director, Production of Co and Content at DC Financial Corporate Group. Sorry.
Sorry about that. So um, the next session is boosting capital markets, develop market efficiency through FPI. Um, the moderator is Martin Kunzman, Director of Production and Content at DDC Financial Group. He will be joined by the following panelists, Jasma Siddiqui, Board Managing Director at SHUAA Capital, Sean He, Founding Partner at Silicon Harbor, and Dr. Douglas Murad, Partner at Gorofa Arab German Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Thank you. Over to the panel. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, so uh, our next panel is going to be discussing uh, FPI, boosting capital markets and how to streamline uh, economies through FPI as opposed to FDI on the last panel, so foreign portfolio investments. Uh, my name is Martin Kunzman. I'm the Director of Production and Content for DDC Financial Group. We're based in Prague. We're a business intelligence uh, platform focused on the NPL industry. Uh, I'm joined on stage uh, by my esteemed colleagues, uh, which I've met today. Very nice to meet you all. Uh, so I'll hand over to you for some uh, brief introductions, starting with uh, Yassim. Thank you, Martin. My name is uh, Jasim Al Siddiqui. I'm the managing director of Shua Capital. Shua is uh, an asset management and investment bank based in the UAE. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. My name is Murad Douglas. I'm a corporate M&A partner at White & Case, which is an international law firm. Uh, I'm based in Germany, but I do a lot of cross-border transactional work. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sean He. I'm a founding partner of Silicon Harbor Capital, which is a private equity firm based in China, investing technologies including semiconductors, robotic technologies, renewable energies, etc. Glad to be, uh, happy to be here. Okay, thank you. I'm quite excited about this panel because we've got some really interesting uh, and diverse perspectives from all of you representing uh, quite diverse regions, so in Middle East, Western Europe, China, so, um, and, and foreign portfolio investment does play quite an important role in all these markets. So uh, perhaps let's start our discussion by uh, talking about what the benefits and challenges are uh, with FPI within your own uh, experiences and regions, starting with Yasin. So foreign, foreign portfolio investment, of course, is very important for a country. Um, it increases the capital inflows of a country, of an economy. With that, what happens is more job creation, more growth in the economy, and so forth. While this is the positive or the advantage of foreign portfolio investments, there are also significant challenges if a country depends on that. For example, Volatility from short-term capital flows can cause disruptions in economies if capital outflow is strong in an economy for a foreign portfolio investment outflow it affects the economy it disrupts it if it's not a long-term uh, FPI so those are you know few of the advantages and uh, challenges of uh, FPI and Perhaps uh, you know, Dr. Murad can add more on this. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think the foreign uh, investments, portfolio investments, foreign direct investments in, in general are very important to an econ economy. And we in Western Europe currently face um, yeah, challenges. I mean, we have an increase of interest rate. We have, therefore, more, more scrutiny on, on bank side to provide funding. But the funding is so important because funding also, not only by, with, with bigger companies, but also with SMEs, venture capitals, to grow, to develop, to foster economy, and therefore to also develop the complete economy, right? So therefore, there, there's a huge need and there's it, it's a lot of potential um, in particular in these times, uh, but there are also challenges. Mm -hmm. And Sean, in, in the Chinese market, it's, yeah, it's very, I, uh, very, very I've been in the private equity investment for about 25 years. Uh, prior to establishing Silicon Harbor, I worked for Intel Capital, the Carlyle Group, the Aeros Management. As I was a global <coughs> partner. 
of uh, both uh, uh, Collar and uh, Aris Manager, which is the largest, one of the largest uh, private equity firm based in the U.S. Obviously, uh, in the last 20 years, we invest in Asia, uh, China, Taiwan, and Korea, et cetera. You know, I witnessed, uh, you know, the economic success of Asia, especially China, um, for, you know, quite a few years. China has entered into high economic growth, make contribution to low inflation globally. So private equity is really um, a very helpful to promote, you know, those countries to develop. What well, we raise the money, obviously, from a capital surplus countries, normally, you know, North Americans, Middle East, you know, and then investing, I, I would call it capital def deficit, you know, uh, countries, uh, Asia and, and China, you know, 10, 20 years ago. So, um, Foreign investment represents a very important, uh, um, you know, uh, tool to uh, develop those less developed countries to make the country today. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, perhaps let's talk a little bit about uh, legal frameworks and and regulation regulatory uh, issues, and perhaps being being the lawyer on the panel, uh, Murad, you'd like to. Tell me a little bit about your experience on that and how, how important it is uh, for investors to work within these frameworks and what the challenges might be. Uh, sure. I mean, it's, I think I can provide like a legal background, but it's very important that also my cool uh, panelists also explain more on the from a practical perspective, right? Mm -hmm. From a pure legal perspective, of course, there are, are challenges. So if you compare F, FPIs to FDIs, the, the difference is in FDIs you have a direct investment, you have a share in a company, whereas in a FPI you have a share in a portfolio. So you do not have a say into the company, which therefore, I mean, there's already a, a major difference, right? So the first question is, what do you want? From a pure financial perspective, I think it makes sense to invest also through portfolios. It is less risky. It has, it ha you share the risk with others, you have a pure financial uh, uh, track record, right? Nevertheless, there are regulatory bound boundaries, and these boundaries are not only in Europe or in China or in, in the UAE or in the Middle East, you can find them w everywhere. So, number one is regulatory framework for establishing certain portfolios. Um, so, if you want to establish a portfolio that shall invest in, for example, Europe, then there are regulatory frameworks that you need to obey, right? But that's 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 for sure. And then on top, um, we 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 have recognized in the recent three to four years a lot of scrutiny uh, in certain investments from foreigners into certain fields uh, of of economy. For example, energy, um, of course, uh, uh, technology, and there governments can play an important role and you should count in when you decide to invest in such com uh, companies or such sectors before you invest and should do your assessment how to avoid or what are the legal backgrounds in order to, to mitigate any, any issues, right? It's, it's, it's comparable to merger control. Merger control is known to everyone, FDI or FBI control not. Um, so I think that's now goes hand in hand and you need to take into account both, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what do you think, Yassin? Well, totally agree with uh, Dr. Murad. Uh, in my opinion, what is more important for an investor rather than the financial element of the FBI is the regulatory and legal element. It is the first priority for a foreign investor to be comfortable with the policies and the legal framework, the corporate governance that the country or the regulator in that country they are investing in is looking at. To me, I think this is more important than the financial element, the return element. And if we look at why other jurisdictions or why there are countries or economies that have less returns but more inflows of capital from outside, the main reason would be the rule of law, the main reason would be the incentive structures, the main reason would be the regulatory aspect, protection of minority interests, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Uh, and Sean, from your perspective in, in China, having recently, let's say, reopened uh, for business, uh, what are your observations uh, that's happening in the market over there uh, in terms of uh, legal and regulatory frameworks? Have they re relaxed or...? Yeah. Well, I think um, um, for China, right, they, they are actually the need of foreign capital uh, more than ever. Uh, you know, we, we all know that the political, geopolitical issues, you know, are decoupling the economics between China and the, especially the United States. So the foreign direct investment in China obviously has been reduced uh, because, mon you know, one of the reasons is pandemic and the other reasons really geopolitical issues. So uh, from government point of view, they are really trying to sti stimulate to attract more foreign direct investment into China. So there's a new policy recently have been promoted, um, you know, to invest in China's infrastructure technology, um, you know. So I think for a regulatory point of view, they, are, they are lose um, certain policies allow foreign, con foreign companies to take a control of joint venture um, in, the, in the key sectors, such as financial sectors, than otherwise uh, in, in, in before. So I think uh, this is echo um, every country's, um, you know, uh, attracting foreign investments really is benefit the local economy. Um, but having said that, I think, uh, you know, we have enjoyed a really good time uh, in the past, you know, high growth, low inflation rate. But look at today, because of the various issues, you know, we, we enter into supply chain shortage, high inflation, low economic growth, so as an investor, you know, um, you know, I think an investor ought to serve a bridge, right, to um, connect the capital side and, and, the, and the market side for, for me to invest in China technology. But, you know, I was very uh, much try to promote my portfolio companies in China to bring the technologies to come outside of China, to come to Middle East, to go to you know, Europe, uh, where the products and technology will be needed. Um, Chinese, China, China right now is investing a lot of, uh, you know, in technology infrastructures and a certain technology is a very global, global competitive, you know, technology being proven in local markets. So that's part of the reason why I'm here. I try to, you know, promote ideas. We can invest in, you know, those you know, Chinese companies, but bring them to, to the world. And I think that they will benefit uh, you know, to our in investors as, as a, you know, uh, to generate the attractive return. Our historical IR is over 60%. But at the same time, really contribute to world peace. I think, uh, you know, in the difficult time, people should really realize, you know, global trade, cross-border investment, aside of, put aside of uh, political differences, it's still a, a very good, you know, way uh, to, to, to unite people as, as human beings, right? To promote the world economy as a whole. Um, I think, uh, for example, healthcare sectors, renewable energy sectors, it's really, it's a global commitment. You know, pandemic really let us aware that the, you know, medical uh, healthcare shortage, not only happening in developing country, but also happening in the developed country like the United States. So. You know, there's, there's a lot of a co cooperative opportunities for different countries, you know, uh, work together to be more technology innovative and benefit, benefit the people, you know, in the world. Thank you. Mm, thank you, Sean. Very interesting. If you just yes. allow me just one, one sentence, because, I mean, I think your, your point is absolutely right. You need to understand the framework wherever you go. And whenever you have, a, have an understanding of where you go, then it becomes easier because then you, you can take a risk, but it's a known risk. Absolutely. If you fail, then you just say, okay, it's my risk. It, you can calculate in, right? Yeah. And, and it's exactly what you're just saying. Then there are so many opportunities in various sectors. It's real estate. Every real estate development has a, has a risk. Right. And there's always also a re regulatory risk. If you know the risk, you can calculate in, and the risk becomes much lower.
And therefore, I think that there's huge demand for FPIs, mm -hmm. as there are for FDIs, right? Yes. But there are also the challenges, and you just need to know and, and understand which, the challenges. Which also highlights the need to have good partners on the ground, mm -hmm. uh, good advisors, uh, co-investors, perhaps, you know. Yeah, so. And your co-investors are the, the most important. So even if you do it through a portfolio, the, the portfolio invests in the company, right? Then this company, you need to very much know what this company is doing and how it is doing, how it did it in the past, and what are the challenges and what what and maybe how can you bring part of the business to your own business? Mm -hmm. So, for example, bring something from Germany or from China to the UAE, right, or, and, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So there we see a lot of opportunities, and I, I think it's the it is the most growing part of the in, in these times, right? Because you have shortage on on various fronts, and this is the the one bridge that can help still fostering the, the, the global market, right? Yeah, agreed, agreed. Okay. Um, Yasim, let's, let's talk about uh, trends and, and uh, your, your, your outlooks that you foresee in, in this sector uh, from your experience. So, FPI is very much related to globalization after World War II. The world has come together, industry is booming, the world opened up, capitalism was spread, etc., etc. This trend has started to reverse. It started in 2018 with the China and US trade war, then continued last year with the Russian and Ukrainian war, and today, more than ever, we see a reverse in globalization. We see a split between the East and the West. We see countries who have exported their industry wanting to bring it back, although more expensive and less feasible. I hope FPI will not be a victim to what we have been seeing in the past year or more likely a few years. We do not want to see in any economy other political powers, geopolitical powers, asking their investors to pull out FPI just because of certain issues, not because of financial issues or not because of regulatory or legal issues. So. I do not think the globe is at its best in terms of the rate of foreign portfolio investment or even FDI. What we have been seeing is a lot of um, um, domestication. Everyone wants to bring industry back. Everyone wants to uh, hedge themselves, build redundancies, and so forth, which is basically the reverse of globalization. So, Cautious, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so definitely this is a trend that has started in 2018, and unfortunately it has been exacerbated last year, and I hope we don't, we don't see more of this going forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Sean, that sort of goes back to what we were talking about in the pre-panel uh, chat about, uh, you know, relations between China and the West and, and how, you know, you, you mentioned earlier there's this golden time around 2016 to 2018 and then things sort of uh, turned uh, a downward trend a little bit. Uh, but now perhaps, you know, we're not sure where it's going to go uh, now with the role that China is, is playing as... Um, peacemaker, let's say, uh, <laughs> but um, in terms of trends and, and where do you see things headed? Well, I, I'm not a political commentator, so, you know, um, I, I can't comment really, you know, on the political issues. <coughs> mm -hmm. I think uh, FPI, FDI, it, it is important, uh, very important to, to, uh, uh, to help um, the different countries to, to work together. Um, I think, uh, you know, the part of my reason here, I try to raise money here, right? <laughs> you know, to be honest, I mean, here, obviously, there's capital surplus countries, a lot of money. Uh, FDI, um, you can invest by yourself or you can invest a, a GPs, 
uh, uh, make strategic investment through GPs to different sectors into different countries and need it because you do need the local insight to make investment. And to make investment successful uh, means you have to have an attractive economical return and also excess influence uh, on your you know, agenda. So I think, uh, you know, I'm a private equity guy, so I like to make the right investment in companies so that, uh, you know, I can set in a board, I can really influence the company. Um, I, I do think uh, globalization is still very important in the future, albeit, you know, there's uh, uh, some difficulties, you know, because I saw every country, so they want to build their own supply chain. Unlike before, every country, they can, you know, manufacturing based on their own unique advantages. But today, I mean, everywhere I go, they want to build their own infrastructures, their supply chains. The U.S. have a CHIP Act. A European is building all supply chain. I mean, uh, here, Middle East, I see a lot of people trying to build EV car manufacturing. You know, it means a lot of a waste of uh, um, resources and low efficiency of this, you know. So I think a, a good future we can looking forward to is still, you know, people will work together you know, make a contribution of their own advantages and uh, make everything, you know, more efficient. Okay, thank you. If you, if you, you just Sean. allow me one, one comment to, to that, these two points. Absolutely. So, so, I mean, I totally agree, right? I mean, Jasmine, you, you, you highlighted the issues that we are currently facing. And in, in, in Europe, you feel it even more than potentially here, right? Because there, there is issues. So we, we don't, we don't feel it here. We are the new center of the world. <laughs> so you know, we, we see it's not only since the, the the war in Ukraine. It's even before that because we had issues when when it, when it started with COVID. We had issues to get masks because they were all produced outside Germany. So there's a huge demand in Europe to say no. We need to have certain production places remain in Europe. But this is not contradicting globalization. You cannot get rid of globalization. Whoever thinks that the, in, the worlds are already so much interlinked that they will need to work together, right? Mm -hmm. And this, this is the biggest chance. I, I, w I would disagree. Some countries have been cut off the uh, financial system. Yeah. So I think this is very much uh, going backwards on globalization. Yeah, no, you're right, and, and I, I totally agree. I mean, and, and, and therefore, there are other ways to then cooperate and work together. And we see, of course, the challenges. So in the semiconductor space, for example, we saw investments from China that were forbidden. So the German government said, we are not accepting, although on, from a legal perspective, we were saying it's fine, right? It should, be, it, should be, it, should be, it should fall under the rules, and then the government had some sort of discretion to say no. So I, 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 therefore, I think it's a, it's a, the investments remain important, but they are challenges. Certainly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm, I'm aware we're a little bit time constricted. Unfortunately, some of the gentlemen have some uh, appointments to, to make. So perhaps I'll just go with one last uh, question. We've, we've talked about uh, the regulatory uh, frameworks being important. So I'd like to know what else can and is being done from your experience to attract foreign investment, to make it easier for investors to, to enter new markets. So perhaps I'll start with, with Sean down the end. Yeah, obviously, I mean, uh, your regulatory is, uh, could be a barrier for foreign investment. Um, well, in China, for example, there's a negative list, right? Certain industry sectors would not allow foreign investment. Uh, that, that could be a, a barrier. I, I'm, you know, I'm expecting some of the rule will be uh, eased so that foreign investors, you know, uh, easier for them to, to come to China to invest. Okay, Murad? Yeah, that's a difficult question. Yeah. I think it's two aspects in, in respect of the regulatory framework. It's trust, trust ba uh, slash partnership. Mm -hmm. Trust, yeah. And the same goal of, you know, making revenues mm -hmm. get at the end of the day if you trust your counterpart if you if you have a basic relationship based on partnership on equal partnership mm -hmm. that is has the same goal then it can be very successful mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you
I think you've had great uh, points from my co-panelists, but I'll just add one more thing, which is opportunities. So the availability of opportunities. You could have the best regulation, the best uh, rule of law, but no opportunities, right? So it becomes uninvestable. So the right opportunities have to be there and the abundance of opportunities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if the opportunity is there, you will find a way, I suppose. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Okay, um, unfortunately we have to wrap up. It was just a, a little panel, but um, yeah, we, we're out of time because the last panel started, uh, finished a little bit late. So um, perhaps we can see if there's any quick questions from the audience uh, at this point. And if not, then I thank you all for joining us uh, today. And uh, thank you very much for, for the, the quick and interesting chat. Much appreciated. Nice to meet you. And uh, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.